afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on free speech and academic freedom, which is sponsored by University of California, Berkeley's Citrin Center for Public Opinion Research. I am Jack Citrin, Professor Emeritus of Political Science, and I will moderate the event and try to manage the Q&A period. Um, to, paraphrase, to paraphrase Bob Dylan, the times they are a changing for free speech and academic freedom. Whereas the trajectory of First Amendment jurisprudence embodied in Supreme Court decisions have greatly expanded the domain of protected speech, social norms and campus rules seemingly are moving in the opposite direction. We seem to be creeping toward a regime of linguistic martial law with a growing number of words, names, topics, and speakers uh, being considered problematic. Many people, this, this shift is actually an overdue assault on harmful and offensive speech and a necessary acknowledgement of historic wrongs against minority groups. To others, this movement is a precursor to censorship, self-silencing, and the erosion of academic freedom. To address these issues, we have a superb panel whom I will briefly introduce in the order in which they will speak. And after the panelists' comments, we welcome your questions, which you can put forward as the talks proceed by using the Q&A option within Zoom. Now to the speaker. Begin with Emily Akers, who is a research fellow and the director of polling at the Cato Institute. She received her PhD in political science, actually, from UCLA. She designs and conducts national public opinion surveys and experiments and is the author of seminal reports, including the state of free speech and tolerance in America, Wall Street versus the regulators and understanding public attitudes towards religion. I wanna note that Emily's surveys are conducted with the highest methodological standards, which is quite rare in our profession these days. And she's also published widely, just gonna mention two articles, the five types of Trump voters and religious Trump voters, how faith moderates attitudes about immigration, race, and identity. So welcome, Emily, and we turn it over to you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be with you this, uh, this afternoon. I have a couple of slides that I want to share, so I'm going to share my screen with all of you. So um, some of, much of the data that I'll be presenting today comes from two national surveys that I conducted in collaboration with YouGov. Um, most of them come from 2017, unless I um, identify it as 2020. Um, and the first finding that I wanted to highlight is this very important juxtaposition that Americans make between what kind of speech they think is morally acceptable and what kind of speech they think that government should play a role in regulating. So the first finding um, that I wanna highlight here is that over, an overwhelming majority, eight in 10 Americans, say that they believe it is morally unacceptable to say things that could be offensive to racial or religious groups. However, a majority of Americans, 59%, um, oppose the idea that government should prevent people from engaging in hate speech against certain groups in public. Instead, most people say that people should be allowed to express unpopular opinions in public, even if they are deeply offensive to people. So I think that distinction is very important to note that people think that this is morally wrong, that kind of speech is morally wrong, but they don't think that the government should be involved in regulating it specifically. But there is a difference among younger Americans. Young Americans think a little bit differently about this. So they agree with older Americans in about similar proportions that that kind of you know, such offensive speech is morally unacceptable. But if you ask about what role the government should have, we see that college age Americans are split basically 50-50. Um, younger people are, are, are more likely to say that the government should prevent people from engaging in hate speech against certain groups in public. And the reason I think this distinction is really important is I, I think for, for many individuals, they believe that 
one support for public policy or regulation on campus that limits this kind of unacceptable speech is a way of demonstrating um, a sincere and authentic concern for trying to minimal, you know, to try to marginalize this kind of speech. For other people, they would say, you know, kind of the Voltaire, um, I think it's apocryphal, right? But his quote of, um, or it's um, summarized by something that he had said, which is, I may disagree with what you say, but I'll, you know, defend your right to say it. So I think that that's very important that people, younger people and older people think differently about that distinction between what is moral and morally acceptable and what the government should be involved in. So let's look at some specific examples. We asked Americans if they would favor or oppose a law that would make it illegal to say offensive or insulting things about, and then gave them very specific groups like the police, Christians, Muslims, members of the military, um, immigrants, African-Americans. And we do see the blue bars represent those, um, the percentages among college age Americans, and the yellow bars represent those among all adults. And I should mention that we did an oversample of college age Americans. So we do have pretty decent size, like five, six, 700, depending on like which subgroup we're looking at of college age Americans. And so what you see here is kind of across the board, the blue, up, the blue bars are higher than the yellow bars, which mean that younger Americans are more supportive of government passing laws that would make it illegal to engage in this kind of you know, hate speech towards these various groups. And it's not just one group over another, but we see it's kind of a general pattern, but we do see a greater differential when it comes to um, passing hate speech laws to protect African-Americans and immigrants. We do see a different approach though among young people um, on other issues where they are more likely to support free speech on things like flag burning. Whereas a majority of Americans would favor a law to make it illegal for a person to burn or desecrate the American flag, which as I'm sure most people on this call know that the Supreme Court ruled is protected by the first amendment. Um, a majority of current students in college age and close to 50-50 you know, of college age Americans say that they actually think it's that they oppose that kind of a law. Similarly, young Americans were more likely to support free speech on certain kinds of religious freedom. So we asked about should the government or would you favor or oppose a law that would prohibit face coverings in public spaces? And we see that most Americans are kind of evenly divided, a little bit more opposed, but you know, college students, younger Americans were solidly in the opposed camp in support of religious freedom, at least in this area. <clears throat> Our survey also revealed an interesting divide about how people think about what colleges should be about. I would say this is kind of like an internal conflict that people have. Um, if you look at the chart to the left, we found we asked people what's more important for colleges. Is it more important for them to prohibit offensive speech on campus that is biased against certain groups? 34% agreed with that or to expose students of all types of viewpoints, even if they are offensive or biased against certain groups. And we got 65% of Americans who agreed with that. And interestingly, both college students and non-college students were pretty much the same on this question. So that's why I'm not showing you two different charts. But if you look at the chart on the right, you'll see that Americans also have another view about what colleges should do. 53% of Americans agree that colleges have an obligation to protect students from offensive speech and ideas that could create a difficult learning environment. So as you can see, colleges are in kind of a difficult position where, you know, kind of they're getting pulled from many different directions. People want it to, the, the university to be kind of this central hub where lots of different ideas and viewpoints can be expressed and you can challenge one another and be able to kind of put it all out there and kind of have a marketplace competition of ideas. But then people also want universities to protect students from certain ideas that if, you know, if they're concerned or those students say that it could make it difficult for them to have a, you know, a thriving, flourishing learning environment. So this is also, I think, something very important when we think about how colleges and universities are thinking about academic freedom. They're getting pulled in multiple directions. And again, 
current students and non-students felt similarly on the second chart as well. Okay, so there's a lot here. So let me tell you what this is about. It's one thing to ask people, do you think colleges should allow controversial ideas on campus? And they say yes or no. It's another thing to give specific examples, concrete situations, and find out what people think about that. So it's easy to say, oh yeah, I think controversial ideas should be allowed on campus, but not that one. <laughs> so that's why we decided to get very specific. And we tried to use examples of actual individuals or groups that had been canceled from speaking at a university or been fired from a job in some sort of high profile way. And we also try to select examples that might be kind of um, at first more offensive to liberals or conservatives to have them both on, you know, both of those types of things on here. And so the blue bars um, are all Americans and the yellow bars are college age Americans. And what you can see is that um, this is the percentage of people who say, that if such a person were invited to give a speech at their college or university, that they should be allowed to speak. So if you look, if you kind of take this in aggregate, you can see that the blue bars tend to extend farther than the yellow bars, which mean that on average, Americans are more likely to say that each of these speakers should be allowed to speak at a college or university, whereas college students or college age Americans are less likely to feel like these individuals should be able to um, give a speech on their college campus. And I want to draw your attention to two in particular. So one, um, let's see, the second from the bottom is the um, a person who publicly criticizes or disrespects the police. You get about half of Americans that say this person should be allowed, the other half says they should not be allowed. Um, a couple points higher, we have the percent of uh, uh, should a person be allowed to give a speech who say the police are justified at stopping African Americans at higher rates. So this is like Heather McDonald from the Manhattan Institute. Um, both of these examples have happened at universities and people have gotten upset. And what I think is really interesting here is if you were to have a public debate to discuss how to improve policing reform, if you were to go off of these numbers, you've got about a half of Americans that want to shut down a speaker that criticizes the police, and they want, and there's another half that wants to shut down a speaker who wants to defend police practices. In that environment, it's probably very difficult to actually have a conversation about how to improve policing. And what in that kind of environment does is it shuts down public debate about police reform, and it probably is more likely to lead to the promotion of the status quo. Like, will things actually change if people are afraid to talk about these things? And they're going to be afraid if both sides feel like they're going to be shut down. And so that's something that I found interesting about these results. Here was one of the reasons that I think college age students um, viewed speakers a little bit differently than um, non-students. We asked people about what would happen if a speaker that is viewed as racist gave a speech on a college campus. And we then I, we gave them, a, you know, a couple of different things that that could mean. And one of them was it would be the same as the college endorsing racism. And what you see here is that college students are a, mo a lot more likely, a majority of them, to say that that would be the same as the college endorsing racism. And so I think that helps explain what we saw on the previous chart, the reason why many college students are more likely to support canceling speakers with offensive views is that they believe that that is tantamount to the university actually endorsing the view of the speaker. So I think that this kind of raises some interesting questions. What is the role of the university? Is every speaker kind of like a public endorsement of what the administration of the university thinks? Or is it kind of, is it this marketplace where lots of different ideas um, battle it out? Um, the fact that people have different views on this, I think is very important into understanding why people respond differently to offensive speakers on campus. We also found some interesting differences between college students and non-students 
um, about this idea of a bias reporting system. That's something we didn't ask, we didn't use those words in the survey because not everyone might recognize that as you know, a set of words but um, those who kind of study this issue are probably familiar with it. But we asked people if they would favor or oppose a confidential reporting system at colleges where students would report people who make offensive comments about a person's race, gender, sexual orientation, age, disability status, or, or disability status to college administrators. You see that most Americans kind of lean, op lean opposed, but it's pretty split, 50-50. But current college students and college age Americans kind of overwhelmingly favor this kind of system. And when you dig into the data a little bit more carefully to see, okay, what might explain the differences there? We ask people about, and I don't have a chart for this, I'll just kind of share it with you. We ask them about their personal experiences. How often do they hear people make offensive comments or you know, engage in stereotyping about people on the basis of their gender or their race in college, students were far more likely to report having hearing or um, having heard this um, all the time, or at least occasionally, about 15 points more likely. And so I think that that explains in part a little bit of the difference that we see in support for a biased reporting system on campus. So now I want to move away briefly to kind of the private sector, you know, away from just the university, but kind of widen it out. So this could be included in the university, but it's a little bit more broad here. We asked people about what should get a person fired. And again, this is moving away from kind of general abstract questions about should people with controversial viewpoints be punished? Um, instead, we ask about very specific viewpoints and we tried to give examples that um, were actually examples of things that got people fired or, or kind of close to it. And again, that would offend conservatives or offend liberals um, to kind of get a sense of um, kind of the distribution. And the green bars represent college students, the blue bars represent non-college students. And um, we asked if a business executive should be fired for their job if they believe any of the following. So it wasn't that they are talking about it at work, but just like if, it, if you found out that they thought this, what would happen? Um, what should happen to them? And the first thing to know is that most people don't think these individuals should be fired. You don't get majorities, but we do see that younger people are more likely um, than non-students to support firing people for these beliefs. Um, you know, look at the first couple of them, it's about you know, 12 to 15 points, percentage point differences. Um, and that is reflective of what we saw about attitudes towards controversial campus speakers. We also found some interesting differences between current students and non-students about in about what businesses should do about employees social media behavior. Most Americans, 53%, oppose the idea that businesses or employers should discipline their employees for posting controversial or offensive opinions on social media accounts. But you see the reverse is true among current students. 66%, two thirds, think that this is something that they would support. Um, and so I think that this is a very interesting dynamic as social media proliferates and more people get on it. People can kind of track any little thing you've ever liked or retweeted. There's a history of it um, and how that will affect how people engage with one another. Does that improve the quality of our dialogue? Um, does it detract? Um, more to find out. This summer, um, we had a really interesting finding. We found that 62% of Americans say they have political views that they are afraid to share, um, or excuse me, that they believe that um, the, the political climate these days prevents them from saying things that they believe because others might find them offensive. So there's this element of self-censorship that is happening. And what we wanted to find out is what issues are people self-censoring? And so we looked at current students versus non-students, and we gave this them this scenario of, you know, what if you were at a restaurant after work with classmates or coworkers, um, and these topics came up, how willing would you be to talk about them? And I have them ranked ordered in, in, in terms of where are the greatest gaps between students and non-students. And I think that this tells us something about kind of the climate around these issues. You know, these are the issues that students are less willing to talk about foreign policy, the police, race relations, immigration, 
um, as well as crime and gun issues, the things that people were that young people were not fearful of talking about were LGBT issues, women's issues, abortion, um, and education. So I thought that those that distribution was very interesting. And kind of wrapping it up here, um, we did find this um, this interesting difference between Republicans and Democrats who attended university and graduate school. We found that Republicans who attended college, um, at college or university were more likely to fear that they could get fired or miss out on job opportunities if their political views became known. But we didn't find that same pattern among, uh, by educational attainment among people who identify as Democrats. So I think that that also is an interesting dynamic about how this is kind of shaping out on college campuses. And then I'd like to wrap up with just one thing. We asked people if it would be hard to ban hate speech because people can't agree what, hates, what speech is hateful. And we found that 82% of Americans agree with this. And I think that um, this survey, if uh, you, you know, you're welcome to go to the website cato.org to read the whole, you know, the whole you know, full length report. But what you'll see is that there really is a lot of disagreement about what ideas are hateful versus offensive, but not quite to the level of hateful or not offensive at all. Democrats and Republicans don't agree on many of these things. Young people versus older people don't agree on these things. And so it becomes quite a challenge to figure out how to approach regulating this kind of speech when people really disagree about what kind of speech crosses the line. So I'll wrap it up here, but I look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks so much. Okay. Sorry. 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 So let me move quickly to the, um, introduce Sean Stevens. Sean Stevens joined the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education in, in 2020 as senior research, senior research fellow in polling and analyst. FIRE is without the, doubt the most important and successful organization in protecting free speech on campuses. Sean obtained his PhD in social psychology at Rutgers, and he then continued to work there and also at Stanford in research, focusing on how psychological factors motivate support for censorship. Among other many surveys of campus expression, he recently completed a pioneering study that ranks colleges and universities in terms of their commitment to free speech. Sadly, only five campuses receive the coveted green light of being supportive. And I look forward to hearing from Sean about this work. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to, like Emily, I'm going to share my screen. I have some slides to present um, and then we'll get started. Okay. So our goal with uh, the, these campus free speech rankings, um, which we did in collaboration with Real Per Education and College Pulse, was to offer a way to comprehensively assess and compare student experiences uh, with expression on their campuses. The idea being we want to give prospective students and parents a better way to understand the colleges they're considering, uh, as well as help administrators, staff, current students enrolled at these schools, uh, and alumni better understand what, what is going on at all these campuses. We also specifically partnered with College Pulse uh, because they have the largest uh, existing sample of current college students. And they have the ability to identify what responses come from which campuses. Uh, and we felt that obtaining campus specific data uh, was going to be very important because even though all colleges kind of exist in the, the national milieu and are, and are certainly influenced by national events, uh, they each are going to face their own unique challenges based on where they're located in the country, based on their size, uh, based on the makeup of their student body, et cetera. Um, 
And if you want to see kind of the full report uh, and the rankings, uh, you can go to the fire.org, uh, our website. Uh, the, they're also available on Real Career Education and on College Pulse's uh, websites as well. Um, brief note about our fielding. Uh, so the survey was fielded last spring. Uh, so from April 1st to May 2008. Uh, hey, Jack. May 28th, sorry. Uh, the data is from roughly about 20,000 undergraduates, all of whom were enrolled uh, full-time in four-year degree programs, and they come from 55 different campuses. And so acknowledgments of the data was collected uh, clearly right at the beginning of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. However, um, data collection was mostly completed uh, before uh, the George Floyd uh, protests began uh, last May. Okay, so some of our key findings were uh, consistent with some of the data Emily showed. A majority of students, roughly around 60%, uh, were able to recall at least one instance uh, where they did not share their beliefs or perspectives because they feared social consequence. So in effect, they self-censored. Uh, race and, and race relations were particularly difficult topics for a number of students to discuss. Uh, and this was especially true for black students. Uh, tolerance for controversial speakers. And, and so we did something similar uh, to, to Emily's study where we presented eight specific speakers um, who probably vary to some degree in their level of, of offensiveness and in terms of the topics that they're planning to discuss. Um, however, tolerance for them across the board was, I'd say, at best tepid. Um, and then in some cases, uh, you know, fairly non existent. Um, and then in addition to this, um, a majority of students uh, say shouting down a speaker was an, is an acceptable form of, of protest. Um, and they appear particularly opposed to uh, students that can, uh, speakers that can be considered or, or perceived as bigoted and hateful. Um, a significant portion of students said they're uncomfortable expressing uh, views on social media platforms where the account is tied to their name. Um, this is more so than participating in class discussions or in written assignments with professors. Um, and then almost one in five students say that the use of violence may be an acceptable form of protest. I'll note that the majority of them said rarely acceptable. Uh, almost none of them said sometimes or always, um, but I think that's a little concerning. So those are kind of some of the, the key findings. Um, I'm gonna go through some of the more uh, specifics now. Um, kind of just covered the self-censorship one. So we'll jump to the openness uh, to discuss different topics. Uh, we asked students to identify which topics they found uh, difficult to have an open and honest conversation about. Uh, they could select as many options as possible. Um, so you see topics like abortion, race, gun control, transgender issues uh, seem to be more difficult than topics like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, affirmative action or feminism. Although on some campuses, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, was uh, a more difficult topic to discuss. Typically, these were more uh, elite schools, um, like the Ivy League, um, and then some of the more public Ivies, which included University of California, Berkeley. Um, so that, I think, is an example of where campus-specific data can start painting a more nuanced picture. Um, nationally, that may not be as difficult of an issue for many college students to discuss, but it does seem to flare up on a small number of campuses. Um, when we slice this by race ethnicity, we can really see how, um, in terms of the topic of race, African Americans do have a very, uh, report a very difficult time um, having open and honest conversations on campus. Uh, this may be that they don't feel they're going to be taken seriously in these conversations or that their concerns are going to be taken seriously. Uh, it could be for a variety of reasons. So I think this is an area that we should probe deeper into. Um, and then I think kind of the, the real meat of, of some of this presentation is the, the tolerance for controversial speakers. So these are the eight speakers we asked about. Uh, and we asked, you know, would you support or oppose your school allowing a speaker on campus who promotes the following idea? Uh, and responses ranged from strongly support to, to strongly oppose. And I think the key takeaway from this figure is that not a single speaker was supported by a majority of the students. Um, the one that got the most support was the US should support Israeli military policy, 
right around 50%. Um, and then Christianity has a negative influence on society uh, is around 45%. Uh, the rest of the speakers are at best around 30% or less. Um, and then you can draw attention to the top uh, portion of the graph. I think we can see that speakers there uh, probably are more like, they, they fall more into the category of their espousing uh, views that can be considered bigoted or hateful uh, towards various different groups in society. Uh, and they get even less support um, than some of these other speakers. Okay. Slicing it a slightly different way, looking at just who strongly uh, the speakers, when they're strongly supported or opposed, uh, we kind of again see that pattern with those top four speakers uh, being really strongly opposed and getting almost no support. Um, moving more towards the bottom, you see like the Israeli, the US which support Israeli military policy doesn't seem to be as a hot button of an issue. Um, in terms of modes of expression, just kind of putting this trying to show various different things and how concerned students really are about social media. Um, I have some data that we've collected in 2021 to show that this is becoming an increasing concern. So I'll mention some of that later. Uh, but as you can see, one in four very comfortable discussing a controversial topic with their classmates. Um, if we also add in somewhat comfortable, that figure gets up to around 60%. Um, so in person, students seem comfortable discussing issues with their classmates. Um, they seem less, slightly less comfortable uh, writing an op-ed or publicly disagreeing with their professor. Um, okay, so I wanna get a little bit into our rankings um, and kind of how we put them together. The overall rankings that we came up with are based on a composite score of five subcomponents. Okay. So the first two, openness and tolerance, make up the majority of the score. They each account for roughly 40% of it. Um, the openness score is based on the question about which items, which topics you feel you can have an open and honest conversation about. Tolerance score was based on tolerance of six of those eight speakers. The remaining components, uh, administrative support, self-expression, and then FIRE's speech code rating uh, make up the remaining 20%. Administrative support was measured by two questions, specifically asking how clear it was that your college administration defends, will defend free speech on campus, like makes their stance on that clear. Uh, and then a question of essentially, what do you think they're actually gonna do when a controversy arises? Okay. The self-expression component was the self-censorship question. Uh, and then the FIRE speech code ratings are the spotlight ratings that come from FIRE's legal policy work. Okay. So these were all kind of put together to create uh, scores. The average overall score, I would say, is not particularly high if, you know, scores ranging potentially from like negative four to a hundred. Um, the reason they could go to negative four is schools would lose points um, for having a red or, or warning rating. Um, so the, the, the lowest possible score is actually below zero. Um, I hypothetically don't think anyone would ever get a negative four or a zero or even get a hundred. I don't know what the true range uh, is. Um, we are collecting data from more schools this year. So hopefully we'll get a better sense of that. Um, but pointing out the overall average score was about 53. Um, the highest score was 64, roughly, and that was the University of Chicago. Um, that, in theory, wouldn't be a passing grade in a, in a class. It's like right below uh, the threshold of a 65. Um, and then the lowest score is about 20 points lower at 44. Um, so the broad takeaway we got from this is while some schools looked better than others, um, and school, some schools that you would expect to score well in our rankings based on effort that they have clearly kind of put in over the last at least five years, uh, if not longer. Uh, overall, I'd say every single one of the schools we surveyed still has work to do uh, on how to make expression more open on their campuses. All right, so I get just really briefly into like why this is important uh, for us broadly. So I wanna bring in, uh, 
Elizabeth Noel New Newman's spiral of silence theory. Uh, so this argues that people in general, we, we possess a quasi statistical sense where we kind of monitor our environment and we're well aware of whether our opinion is in the, the majority or, or the minority. Uh, and then because we're also social beings who want to be liked by others and included uh, in a community, we're motivated to avoid uh, ridicule, ostracism, criticism, um, and uh, social isolation. So what happens is when your view is in the minority, um, what can occur is the majority is, you know, it's, it's very clear that this view is in the majority. Uh, and so some members of the minority may elect to self-censor um, because they don't want to get involved in arguments or disagreements, um, et cetera. And this can kind of distort people's perceptions of where true opinion stands. As the minority expresses themselves less and less, it creates the impression that that view is not uh, held very widely. Um, and so that's an effect of the spiral of silence in that over time, it becomes increasingly clear that one view is uh, the dominant perspective and another one is in the minority. And you may wind up in a situation where that minority view is only expressed by kind of hardcore true believers. Okay. And so I think where we're at at this point, um, both on the basis of fire real clear and college polls is very large study here, as well as other studies that have been done over the past five years or so, is I think we have um, enough, what I would say like canaries in the coal mine uh, to indicate that there is a, there's a problem with self-censorship on campus uh, among students. So I'm just gonna put up a few quotes. I realize I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I should wrap up here. So I'll put up just a handful of quotes here from various students asked about their experience with self-censorship uh, I'll note some of these are from students at schools that did very well in our rankings, like the first two. Uh, University of Tennessee uh, was also a highly ranked school. Um, and then draw, uh, draw attention to, as, as you go through these quotes, um, what also emerges is there's not just kind of that general sense of, oh, I sh should just, you know, not really kind of try to stir the pot so much, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, it's not really worth my time. Uh, what also emerges is uh, students really focus on whether their view is in, a, whether their political views are in the majority or minority. Um, and so you can see students on Brown's campus uh, basically saying it's really, it's really hostile here to conservative views, but on the flip side, students on BYU's campus say it's very hostile here to liberal views. Kansas State student basically says, hey, it looks like it's pretty mixed here. And so you're kind of taking a risk either way uh, with what you throw out there. Um, so these are just kind of some student experiences of it. And I, you know, hit on basically the landscape after George Floyd is, I think this is going to, I think we might see something very different uh, when we get our results this year. Um, like I said, we collected all of our data for the most part uh, before the protests began. Um, this summer was by our busiest ever in terms of cases that uh, we took, took on, et cetera. Uh, internally, we've been tracking attempts to sanction uh, faculty, uh, and we recorded over 100 attempts in 2020. Um, sanctions can include calls for suspension, removal of tenure, termination, or even uh, retraction of published research. Uh, and we've also seen students increasingly getting in trouble uh, for social media activity and posts that have, um, that, that is basically protected expression, but has little to do um, with any discussion in the classroom. And then basically just some peek at our 20, some of the 2021 data we've collected already and then I'll wrap up, is we did a pretest in January. It was on 526 students. Um, about 40% of them said all of their courses were online in the fall. Um, over half said racial inequality was difficult to discuss. Uh, and about 40% said the George Floyd protests were as well. Um, we changed up the controversial speakers. We, we now have, uh, we made sure to have four speakers that are very offensive to liberals and four that are very offensive to conservatives and tolerance pretty much across the board for each of these speakers remains pretty tepid. Um, we found that one in five students reported they've never self-censored on campus. We switched that to a frequency uh, based question. So that 
seems to be an even larger amount of students self-censoring. Um, and the percentage of students saying violence was never acceptable declined uh, to about 70%. Um, and then where we're at now is we have roughly almost 5,000 responses. Um, and again, we're seeing most students are basically entirely online. Um, and um, very few of them report not self-censoring, okay? And then the last thing is just a few more student quotes um, indicating that what I, what I guess we really wanna draw attention to here is the first one uh, where a student is basically saying, the fact that we're basically all online now, our, my face is basically glued and, and it's on the screen at all times uh, and it's being recorded and, and you know, we're being stared at, it, it kind of makes it even harder sometimes to express ourselves. Um, and so I think this is kind of a growing, uh, growing area where we wanna pay attention to is that as um, the college experience uh, shifts from, from in-person to, to more online learning, um, it, it seems very possible that um, student experience with how they express their ideas is going to change. Um, so I'll end there uh, to get to our next speaker, um, but I look forward to, to discussing ideas further and, and questions you guys might have. Thank you very much, Sean. These are really incredible, incredible studies and the work that FIRE does, as I said, really important. And I think in many ways, your findings and Emily's findings sort of uh, reinforce each other. Our next speaker is Donald Downs, who is the Alexander Micklejohn Professor of Political Science Emeritus and also the Affiliate Professor of Law and Journalism at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Don received his PhD in political science at Berkeley, and he's written widely on freedom of speech, political and legal movements, citizenship, campus politics, domestic violence, and more. He has a number of prize-winning books. I'm only going to mention a few. One is Nazis in Skokie. Another is The Politics of Pornography. A third, Liberalism and the Crisis of the American University. And a recent book that I truly admire is The Value and Limits of Academic Free Speech. Professor Downs is not just an Ivory Tower scholar. He was the co-founder of the University of Wisconsin Center for the Study of Liberal Democracy and the president of the Faculty Committee for Academic Freedom and Rights, which successfully fought attempts to monitor and regulate the content of faculty teaching at Wisconsin. So on floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Jack. And thank you for everybody participating in this event. Uh, Jack asked me uh, a question beforehand about whether or not things have changed a lot over the last several years or during my tenure as a campus free speech activist. And uh, it's an interesting question. I'll, I'll try to address it. And um, especially in relationship to the research that Sean has done at FIRE. Uh, Sean didn't mention it, but UW-Madison, you know, my institution, um, ranked pretty low in that list of 51 campuses. I think it was 45th or something. Sean could respond to that later. And uh, <laughs> but I'll be talking today about successes, the group we had, because Jack also wanted me to address this, the more practical question, what to do about the problem. And that is the emphasis of my, of my talk today. But um, it's interesting that how things may have changed since the group that I was involved with, the Committee for Academic Freedom and Rights, uh, uh, went out of existence. It existed from 1996 to 2016. And we had a lot of policy successes at Wisconsin. Uh, I won't get into all those now. We abolished speech codes on the basis of a political movement without being required to by a court. Uh, we had a lot of influence on a lot of other policies on campus, but that was five years ago. And it's very possible that things have changed since our group, which did have a kind of a critical presence on campus, uh, has gone out of existence. And uh, plus things have also changed a lot uh, on the ground since that time. So that's something I think that's worth addressing later. Okay, so let me start with, uh, in my book, I talk a lot about mobilization and what we can do to try to make things better. And the book was, half half full, the glass was sort of half full and half empty. Uh, it was meant to say that there's hope out there if people do the right thing, 
uh, that free speech is embattled rather than disappeared on campus, but a lot depends on what we do. And uh, there are four necessities that are sort of a starting point, and then I'll get into more specifics. Uh, the first is to acknowledge that there's a problem and to try to be as objective as possible about it. Uh, and that includes acquiring knowledge about what's going on and also about the principles of academic freedom and free speech that are at stake. The second thing is more psychological or personal, and that is to care about it. I mean, it's one thing to see what's going on, another thing to know what, you know, what, what could be harmed in terms of free speech, but you have to actually care about that. And that's getting into a more of a cultural kind of issue uh, that uh, uh, can become more problematic. The third thing that is doing something about it by mobilizing. And here's, you know, Sean talked about the spiral of silence, which I didn't talk about in my book. And I really wish I had, because I think it's a fantastic theory here. Uh, because one of the themes that I've been stressing is that the, to the extent there is a silent majority on campus that doesn't like what's going on, or at least a critical mass of influential people on campus that care, uh, they need to be mobilized or given voice. And it's hard for a lot of them to do so if they feel isolated and feel that the costs and benefits relating to getting involved are uh, not advantageous to them. So mobilization can be crucial by building some public presence and support for the principles of academic freedom and free speech and uh, providing cover for others then. So people on campus are gonna say, wait a minute, this idea that this kind of speech should be protected really isn't that crazy after all. Look, so-and-so is saying so. So-and-so is supporting the right to speech here. Maybe I should speak out too. And then the fourth sort of background principle or, or necessity is prioritization. And this is a big theme that I've been stressing that uh, there's a lot of universities are complicated affairs. University of California's former uh, president, um, Kerr, uh, wrote a famous book about the multiversity. There's so many different activities at universities, you know, sports, uh, clubs, internships, you name it. So it's easy to get to lose the forest for the trees. And uh, the forest here are the intellectual virtues, which include academic freedom, uh, the intellectual freedoms, uh, as well as you know, the rigor of thinking, et cetera, that, the scholarly excellence. That is our distinct purpose as an institution. That's why we are, enjoy the freedoms and benefits that we enjoy. And the other things are important, but they're secondary compared to that. Because if we don't take those principles seriously, we're really not a university anymore, we're something else. Now, when I talk about mobilization, I distinguish between local mobilization on campus, which is pretty much the Madison model that we uh, went through uh, the other is appeal to the outside. And uh, the two can go together, of course. So there are really three models, local mobilization, appealing outside for help. This could involve going to a court and getting a court decision. Uh, it could involve en enlisting, enlisting you know, publicity. It could involve uh, getting outside help from fire. And I agree with Jack, fire is the preeminent institution for this. And you know, Cato has been very good also in terms of the surveys that Emily's involved with and others at Cato, tremendous surveys. And you know, they published my book, so I'm grateful to them for that. Uh, so those are outside institutions I think are important. And there's the mixed model where you mobilize locally, but also use uh, outside support. The uh, success we had at Madison with the Committee of Academic Freedom and Rights <clears throat> was largely based on local persuasion. But we also resorted to the press. We also resorted to fire in some cases, you know, a lot of interaction among us. And um, uh, but it was largely local. And our success locally was pretty much was fortuitous. We just happened to have the right kind of cases that we went public with. We had the right number of faculty members that had 
enough respect on campus to be taken seriously to create a movement centered on our committee that couldn't be dismissed. And we had allies outside. So we, it was almost like an eclipse. Things lined up well for a number of uh, years. Now, why do I prefer though emphasizing local mobilization? Uh, it goes to the issue of persuasion. When you enlist, if you rely too much on outside support, like even a court order or um, some other pressure group coming in, first of all, sometimes they have their own agendas. Fire is very careful about this, but other organizations may not be, especially if, resort, if you resort to the legislature. Uh, and you want to be able to control the situation. And local persuasion really is based more on internal persuasion, which is consistent with the academic freedom of the institution, not just individuals. Uh, and, but when things are really rough outside reference or deploying an outside resource to help can be very useful. And I think of a book I studied in graduate school uh, at Berkeley in political science, uh, Grant McConnell's Private Power in American Democracy. And the book is based on the idea coming from Madison's Federalist Number 10, that if you are in a local situation where you're outpowered, overpowered, and you have a cause of justice, expanding the scope of the conflict to bring in outside interest and stakeholders can be very useful to giving you the kind of power that you need to fight the local uh, oppression. And uh, that can help be helpful in terms of campus free speech uh, policies as well and politics. Uh, but relying primarily on the local effort requires you to persuade people. And persuasion, A, is applicable to an institution based on discourse and reason. Uh, I think it's, it's more normatively acceptable. And I think it's also strategically more advantageous because you have to change people's minds about certain policies in order to get that support. And in doing so, you sort of change the way they think about something perhaps. And you've created a kind of infrastructure that can be in place on campus that can then be utilized in other cases that arise. And that is exactly uh, what happened uh, with us at Wisconsin with the Committee for Academic Freedom and Rights. Uh, 1999, we were the first university in the country to abolish a speech code. It was a, an infamous faculty speech, faculty speech code. And we did it the old fashioned way. We did it through going through the faculty senate and persuading people. And over the next 10 years or more, we ended up having the university would come to us to deal with a lot of these issues. And we had a lot of influence over policy, which I don't have time uh, to get into. Okay. so. Um, that's sort of the argument for mobilization and especially emphasizing the local, but not ignoring external uh, outreach. So in conclusion, let me mention uh, back in 2017, I attended FIRE's conference in Dallas about free speech in higher education, uh, put it together by you know, Peter Benila. And I was asked to talk about mobilization and I came up with a list of 10 to do's, uh, sort of like you know David Letterman's uh, ten whatever it was he did every night, uh, ten questions. I had a list of six things to do to try to bring uh, about change, on, constructive change on campus. And the first one is civic commitment. You have to care. You have to care about why free speech matters on campus, and feel that it's something that matters to you. It matters to the institution that you care for. That's sort of the starting point. So that's a civic commitment kind of angle. Uh, second of all, is being willing to make that commitment and the reasons for it public, giving public presence to this concern that all of us on this panel have. Uh, because without that, people are going to think this goes back to the spiral of silence. Again, thanks to Sean for bringing it up. Uh, issue. Uh, Alan Bloom once said that in his famous book, The Closing of the American Mind, that sometimes the most effective tyranny is that which makes one think that certain ideas are not even thinkable anymore. 
And so by going public, and this is what we did at Madison, going public with this, these, this commitment, puts it out there in the public sphere. So now it's recognized as something viable. And upon that, you can, can then build. Third Downs point here is mobilization, which I've already discussed. And it's you try to develop a, criti a critical core of supporters on campus, people you can trust, and especially trust under pressure. And if things go well, you then develop a kind of you know, critical core that gives credibility to the issue that might, if things go even better, can lead to a kind of bandwagon effect on campus. And that is what we experienced here, at least in terms of policy, until through 2016. Uh, four, take advantage of any crises. We had some very problematic applications of speech codes at Madison, some of which we didn't find out until two or three years later. So a lot of this stuff, as Laura Kittness points out in her incredible book on her experience, uh, takes place under the radar screen. Uh, through administration. People often who are targeted don't want to go public with it because it can tarnish their reputations. So a lot might go on beneath the radar screen. In my latest book, I talk about some of those cases. Uh, uh, it's a key area to look at what Coors and Silverglade called the shadow university, you know, the founders of fire. And so uh, you need to uh, promote the message that way. And build, if you can point out certain examples of crises and clear misapplications of justice on campus when it comes to these principles, uh, then that arouses interest and shows people that there's a problem. Okay, uh, four or five, uh, reach out to appropriate allies outside. And I mentioned this already, so I'll be very, I won't say too much about it. The press can be very good. Fire is excellent, groups like fire. Uh, politicians, I'm much more wary of them because they have their own agendas and sometimes they can uh, harm the acad academic freedom of the institution itself. Uh, but as Joe Cohn has pointed out in his incredibly interesting and productive work at FIRE about legislation involving free speech on campus, uh, there are certain key areas where legislation is pretty straightforward and can be very helpful. And when the more complicated it gets, the more it opens the door to outside intervention that's inappropriate, uh, but it can be useful. But you gotta be careful. You're playing with fire. Uh, as Hannah Arendt wrote, truth and politics don't always go together very well. And final point is realize that getting involved on campus uh, can be fun. It can be exciting. It can be interesting. Uh, it changed my career. And I know a lot of other people that feel the same way about it. And especially if you can get student allies. <clears throat> One of the disconcerting things about the research we've heard today is sort of the changing of students' minds over these issues. But students can still be inspired by this. And uh, uh, they can become part of the adventure, so to speak. And uh, I think it can be good for your conscience as well if you get involved this way. Uh, because then you can live with yourself as a, a campus citizen. Uh, so I think that's, that's a basic argument or my basic points about what we might be able to do about it. But you've got to start and, you know, seek and you, you shall find. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dawn, and you have been a warrior in the, in the important cause, and I really congratulate you for all that you've done, and it's gone beyond Wisconsin. So I turn now to our final speaker, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce a very good friend, Gordon Silverstein. Gordon is now the Assistant Dean for Graduate Programs at Yale Law School, and he's also a lecturer in political science at Yale College. Gordon received his PhD from Harvard and he has taught at Dartmouth, Rice and Minnesota before joining the political science department at Berkeley, his last stop before moving to Yale. Gordon was a legendary teacher at Berkeley with overflowing courses in constitutional law, the first amendment, 
and comparative constitutionalism, among others. He's the author of Imbalance of Powers, Constitutional Interpretation and the Making of American Foreign Policy, and more recently, a prize-winning book, Law's Allure, How Law Shapes, Constrains, Saves, and Kills Politics. So it's a pleasure for me to turn over the floor to Gordon. Thank you, Gordon, for being with us. Oh, thank you, Jack. It's uh, it's really uh, wonderful to see you again. It's been uh, it's been much too long. And uh, one one more shot, and and I can get out to California and see you. So. <laughs> it's 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 on its way. Uh, so I, I I'm I'm delighted to be back in Berkeley, even if it's only virtually. Um, and uh, you know I. I, I wouldn't be exaggerating to say that uh, every single time I walked across Sproul Plaza for 10 years, uh, I marveled at it. Uh, this is the the living monument to free speech uh, and uh, living and breathing and, and still playing playing a role in it. Uh, so uh, Berkeley has really a unique position to play in, in, in thinking about and talking about free speech. Um, I wrote a book that Jack mentioned, uh, Laws of Lure, some years ago, and um, the argument was that there are major unintended consequences of relying on the courts to resolve social and political disputes. I won't go into that argument, but I think that the free speech question certainly fits fits in with that uh, as well. Um, this this panel, you know, gave me a chance to think a bit more about where First Amendment jurisprudence might be headed right now. Um, but you know, I have one one foot in the law school and one foot in political science, and and I think actually that at the moment the the the, the more interesting questions may involve politics than than the law. Uh, the court has been more expansive and 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 spending a good deal more time on the First Amendment. Some people argue that the court has weaponized the First Amendment uh, or Lochnerized it. For those of you who do remember your your constitutional law, uh, meaning simply that it it has used it as a as a as a major platform for um, expressing and and uh, shaping jurisprudence in in lots of different arenas. So whether it was in campaign finance or uh, in the Obamacare uh, questions about the provision of uh, of contraceptives, uh, there's 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 a dozen different examples that we could we could think about. But this panel is a chance to think about also uh, speech on campus and speech more generally, um, and uh, and and the way in which uh, that that uh, this becoming a legal fight rather than a battle in the marketplace of ideas. You know, it's very disturbing, obviously, for somebody of my age and from my tradition before I went to graduate school, I was a journalist for uh, a number of years for the Wall Street Journal and for the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, so I have, I have very, you know, mid-century attitudes about uh, free speech. Um, and I'm seeing a very different world around me. I see language used in a very different way. I see uh, people hesitating in, in different ways. Um, so I, 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 I want to think about it from the legal perspective, but I also want to think more broadly rather than just within the confines of the traditional First Amendment jurisprudence uh, to think about where the court and, and where our legalistic sort of mind uh, will go. Um, I'm also thinking in a in a slightly different vein now, and thinking about the the kind of transformative shift that I think has been underway for the last five to ten years or more, uh, away from the idea of persuasion uh, with the objective of achieving policy goals, and 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 really towards the towards the expression of naked power. Um, Don Downs, uh, who has forgotten more about the First Amendment than I will ever know. Uh, you know, beat me to the punch on, on two different things, uh, uh, no surprise. But one of them was was on thinking about uh, Madison and, and Federalist 10. And I think it's actually remarkably relevant here. Um, Federalist 10 was, was Madison's attempt to uh, uh, identify a solution to the great problem that he thought would destroy uh, democracy and had destroyed all the great democracies, essentially special interests, what he called factions. And that this was the great threat to democracy uh, was that people would hive off and and pursue their their narrow uh, uh, objectives at the cost to the society as a whole. Uh, and and the answer was he, his answer his surprising answer was not to tighten the noose and make it a smaller and smaller country with less and less diversity. His answer was what he said to expand the sphere to multiply factions. If 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 a few factions are bad, 
uh, then a lot of factions are good. And the more, the better. And the reason was because you would force negotiation uh, in order to, you know, my enemy today is my friend tomorrow. The, the person that's going to vote with me on a commerce clause bill is going to be against me on environmental regulation. And so we can be opponents, but we know that we can also move. And, and there had to be that fluidity, that movement that uh, that area of persuasion and of course speech fits right into that that's that's a key element in human persuasion is speaking arguing debating uh and so to lose that is is tremendously dangerous and tremendously uh threatening but the point was to create a need for pluralism and uh uh and 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 in some ways the problems of the mid-century were the problems of the center disciplining the extremes, um, uh, trying to rein in the extremes of left and right. And now it seems like it's actually flipped and it's the extremes that are starting to discipline the center um, and at the cost of pluralism and at the cost of achieving policy. Now it may be that, that we just don't really have policy goals any longer. And so we're reduced to this fight about power, but I don't think that's the case. Uh, and, and, and so I don't necessarily have an answer, but I'm, I'm putting these things out to, to stimulate conversation because I'm genuinely uh, curious about it. Um, each of these subgroups has effectively disciplined its members, voting them off the island if needed, call it canceling, call it primarying. Uh, these are all different versions of it. Um, and the campus of, is, of course, a microcosm uh, for this. Uh, you know, I'd love to call for a return to my own world, my own preferences, a world of mediated media where there were editors and then editors above the editors and where material was checked and fact checked and uh, and where you had a full day to write and edit uh, and there were professional standards to meet and uh, there were you know a dozen great newspapers and three networks on TV but that that world is gone and it's not coming back and uh, so I think we need to think really in fresh and different ways about uh, censorship and about the First Amendment and about uh, the means for regulating that um, so we have to rethink I think the effect uh, uh, and, and the ways in which we can achieve some of the goals that, that, that I think we share in terms of persuasion and not just mere exercise of power for the sake of doing that. So here's the twist. Um, you know, the, the, the classic free speech was, was the government versus the individual, the government versus students, the government versus the left, the government versus the right. Uh, and now it's been privatized. Um, the great battles of, of, of speech right now are underway on Twitter, in Facebook, in these privatized private platforms. And if that's the case, then our jurisprudence is going to be a very different jurisprudence. We shouldn't be looking so much at necessarily at the First Amendment as perhaps at antitrust. Um, maybe that's the way in which uh, that's the battleground on which we're going to fight the next round of, of First Amendment battles or speech battles. Um, I also think that tech is uh, tech is the problem in a lot of ways. It, 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 it has undermined the Madisonian concept because there isn't the fluidity. The, the tech sort of took Madison and blew by him by a hundredfold and said, if it's not enough to expand the sphere, it, we, we, can, we can expand the sphere un, to an unlimited degree. You can have an unlimited reach across the globe and through the, the world uh, on, on these platforms, and they're not subject to the same level and degree of regulation uh, and, and litigation under the First Amendment as, as, our, as was the government in its day. So tech may be the problem. I, I don't want to blame tech. I don't think it was a conscious choice. I don't think anyone's trying to, to achieve this, but uh, tech has been, I think, a big part of the problem. And if going backwards in time to a different era is not a possibility, then maybe we also should be thinking about tech as a solution. Um, do we want Zuckerberg and, and Twitter to be the filters, to be the, 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 the quasi-government, the substitute government? I don't think anyone particularly welcomes that. The privatization of the marketplace of ideas is something I think we really have to think very hard about. And, and again, uh, you know, the days of, of the World War I draft objector as being the, the source of the great uh, First Amendment case, that, that maybe we need to shift our, our gears. And as I said, think about antitrust, think about uh, private public distinctions, uh, the fragmentation of the market, the isolation of the market, uh, and, uh, and, and get a focus again on policy and, and persuasion. Um, the privatization of speech doctrine is not something that sits very well with me, and 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 I, but but I think there are other things that tech has done that are a plus. So, 
you know, for example, I'm I'm speaking with you at Berkeley right now. Um, if I were a different person and a highly controversial speaker, uh, five years ago, if we, if I were coming to campus, there would be armed guards, there would be tear gas, there would be uh, a, a cordon sanitaire to get me in and to get me out. And now I can jump all of that. We can all jump all of that. We can jump zoom in. We can zoom into anything and out of anything with no barriers. Uh, so I think that's a that's a net plus from the technology uh, that that Zoom jumps those barricades and can bring any idea, any speaker to campus uh, in ways that would be impossible uh, even a few years ago. Um, so as as I as I said, I think that that uh, the real action in free speech may be moving towards antitrust uh, questions about deplatforming and 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 quasi governmental functions, uh, things that we haven't really talked a great deal about. In the in the traditional free speech uh, arena, um, uh, so uh, you know, is there is I think there is a place for law. I think that that uh, and, and jurisprudence, but as I say, I think it's going to be a very different one uh, coming up. So maybe I'll I'll leave it with that and 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 uh, engage any questions you might have or comments. Thank you, Gordon. And um, we have a we have several questions here, and I have a question of my own, which I want to ask at some point. But let me ask the questions. I'm going to sort of try to truncate the questions and also ask the speakers, whoever speaks, to be relatively concise in answering, because we do have, um, uh, we have limited time. So the first question actually comes from a student. And um, she, let me just paraphrase her question. She says that she has encountered herself pushback when she's tried to argue in this particular case. The example she gives is that capitalism has helped immigrants. Apparently that was not a popular uh, uh, point of view in her econ class. And she, she asks about how do we prioritize free speech over the worry about people being offended. And she also says, how did it come to this? How did, it, how did we get to a point where students are afraid to hear other points of view? So I throw that open. Uh, uh, whoever wants to take it on, Emily, do you wanna start? Or uh, you've done these surveys of students and you have some overtime. Yeah. It's my, um, based on the data that I've seen, I actually think he, there would be a lot less of a conflict by talking about things like, does capitalism uh, do more to help or harm new immigrants to the United States? I actually think that's a topic that is something that um, wouldn't cause too much conflict, but I really liked what Sean mentioned earlier as he, as he invoked the, 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 the spiral of science. Silence, is that Silence. correct, Sean? Um, and how that could play a role here. So I'm gonna, I think, Sean, you know, I think I'd like to hear your thoughts on that and how that could play a role in this situation. Yeah, so I, you know, I, there's a lot of ideas out there of kind of the role of, of social media uh, in this and, and kind of its explosion over the last decade. Um, some ideas about, you know, shifts in, in um, like approach to bullying, et cetera, as well. Uh, I think, you know, but broadly like setting, whether or not those are accurate or not, I'm not, I don't know. I don't know like how much of an effect all of these different things might have. Um, but I, I do think that what we see in a lot of cases, the capitalism thing is actually a really interesting example because I agree with Emily that it's kind of benign almost. It seems like a, a reasonable question to discuss. And so what I, what I think, you see here with this specific example is something that Gordon was getting at where we've gotten to a point now where people kind of know that they can say certain things like that, like, oh, that comment is harmful. And it, it might be more of like a, a power move um, in a situation like that than it really is that they're mm -hmm. offended by the idea that capitalism has maybe helped immigrants or, or something like that. Um, and so I think it's becoming more and more difficult on one level to differentiate like legitimate claims of people saying, well, that is really hurtful to me. Versus I'm, I know I can say this to kind of 
further entrench my majority view, et cetera, et cetera. I think moves like that in, in relation to like spiral silence, I think a move like that, um, I think attempts to shout down a speaker. Um, some of the things we saw support for, like in both of our, the, both the survey data that we presented, um, they're all indications of the majority knowing that they can, they can kind of do this. And, and when they pick and choose who they're gonna shout down or who they're gonna say like, oh, that's a hurtful comment on it's, it's, it's in effect trying to establish the boundaries of what is an acceptable discourse and what is not. Good, thank you. Now, here's a question that I think raises um, um, a, a point that uh, both Don and um, uh, Don and Gordon spoke to it's from Brad Barber, colleague. California State Senator Menendez has introduced legislation to make political affiliation and view point diversity protected classes in California. The UK is also considering legislation to protect ideology and academic freedom. Are these good ideas? Are they politically possible? So big question, maybe a brief answer from the two lawyers here or the two constitutional experts. I'll start just by, by saying that it certainly it, there's a research that has just been done by a professor in London, he had not been in the Wall Street Journal and he communicated with me before that. I gave him some advice on, or some input on what he was doing. And uh, he shows that there actually is more discrimination against conservative type viewpoints. Of course, you know, conservative is a broadly defined category. Uh, so that is a, a problem in the issue of political diversity on campus obviously is an issue. But you know, going back to work that Gordon's done, uh, there is a limits of the law or limits of policy issue here. Uh, you know, a question of definition, how you apply it can be very difficult. If you have a clear case of political discrimination based on viewpoint, uh, and when someone doesn't get tenure and the scholarship is really good, then that should be something that's actionable, but it's difficult really to get at that and uh, especially, you know, given the history of court review of academic freedom questions, uh, and it's a broader policy, it's, I think it's, it's a tough road, it's a difficult thing to pull off. So it's a, there's a clear practical issue there, which would suggest that we deal with it by other means than, than the law. I'm sorry, Jack, I lost the, I lost the tail end of what you, what the question was on the computer. Well, um, I think, it, the question was, is it a good idea to have a law saying that uh, political views are like a protected class such as race and gender and so forth? Yeah, I think Don's right. I, I think that's, uh, you know, the definitional issues would just be tremendous. A pattern, a pattern of abuse would be, would probably be the way to get at that. Yeah, give an example. Some Board of Regents once, not here, but elsewhere, asked me if there should be affirmative action for conservatives. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say what state it was, but the first, my first response was, oh my goodness, you're going to start getting all these people that once identified as Democrats suddenly becoming convenient conservatives <laughs> and applying for the job. We'll just start with that. So you got a fraud question. <laughs> Here comes, a, here's a question from Tom Mann, which is interesting. Um, and I'll, I'll just read it. Has questioning of truths, facts, and science, as well as the rise of conspiracy theories, during the Trump years has had any impact on the free speech concerns of the panelists? So this is a question for the panelists. Uh, throw it open to you, Emily, you're nodding your head there. You've written about Trump and Trump voters and so forth. Oh, well, um, the reason I was shaking my head or nodding my head there was that um, when I uh, was, was designing the survey that I present today, I did a lot of research into understanding the different perspectives. And I read a lot of student manifestos, watched a lot of protests, you know, where students would, would try to prevent a speaker from being able to speak in front of the audience that wanted to hear them speak. And if you listen to what they're saying, that, that's a lot of what they were saying is that like the idea, I think a lot of people assume that in the free market, in, in like the marketplace of ideas, free speech means that the truth will ultimately win out. 
But here we have a case that many people feel like free speech did not allow truth to win out. And a lot of people are engaging in spirit conspiracy theories. And um, for many people, very upset with who was elected. The idea that free speech allows the truth to win out was undermined. And I, I'm very, I, I'm sympathetic and empathetic for that concern. Um, I just think we need to talk about well, over what time horizon. It doesn't necessarily mean that at any given moment, <laughs> the truth will win but the idea is that over time that um that 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 history bends toward the truth um and so that was why i was kind of shaking my head that we certainly saw that in our survey data where a lot of young people in particular uh, kind of had their faith shaken in that idea and i think that the the rise of kind of the proliferation of conspiracy theories that have been aided with social media have really undermined many people's faith that free speech ultimately allows the truth to win out I would build a little bit there on, on the social media point. Um, I, I think it's actually, it's not necessarily clear that uh, this has upticked in recent years. It just might be that social media allows us to see that there are all these kind of kooky uh, beliefs <laughs> out there and they're just easier to find now. I don't like, that's like a chicken and egg argument almost, but I think it's like building on that point of, I, I do think a lot of these kooky ideas or, or hateful ideas or bigoted ideas that, that students are really vociferously opposed to, I, they've been around for a while, um, but they're kind of out of public view. And, and I think something like social media makes it easier to see uh, the extent to which people have these ideas. And just briefly, I mean, this, this, you know, this is not new. This, the, I think, I think, well, Don would probably agree. I, this goes back at least to the '60s, to the best and the brightest, to the to the failure of Vietnam, and the and the death of expertise began then. I mean, the, yeah. the challenge to expertise. Yeah, very quickly. This goes back to Gordon's point about how social media is moving, you know, changing the map. Uh, yeah. And I agree very much with this analysis about antitrust, et cetera, as something to be taken seriously. Uh, given what's happened. But a lot of the problem is we're not, we, we maybe need to move the, and this goes, to, I make a distinction in the book between academic freedom and free speech and how academic freedom itself requires certain standards, right? Certain standards of intellectual validity. And we need to be teaching that more. So people, rather than simply saying, we need to know more about what free speech is about and why it matters, which of course we do, we also need to be more active in teaching how to think in the right kind of ways, in a ways which are intellectually credible without resorting to so-called truth squads. And which also would you know, just realize the importance of science at the same time that science is always an ongoing investigation and science, part of science is proving itself wrong. So we need to direct ourselves to how to think about these things as a counter to the conspiracy theories rather than just talking about free speech, I think. And that's where universities come into play. And if we undermine what we're doing as distinct institutions, which is not just simply the intellectual freedoms, but the quality of thought and the intellectual rigor of thought, then we're forsaking our contribution to democracy. Good. I think I'm going to try and squeeze in three questions. And I'm going to combine this question with my own question. And this is, I think, to both. Sean and Emily here. This is from someone I'm really thrilled. Of. Someone from Minneapolis, my wife's hometown, is uh, coming in here, and, and she says, um, "Well, she says, would it be helpful to have senior citizens take your surveys?" I was somewhat surprised about some of the percentages. So let me combine that question with my own, which is really to have you maybe comment briefly on some of the, you know, you compared the general public with students as a whole. But there must have been variation within both of those groups. You talked about age also, Emily. So I'm just curious, what were the sort of the main variations? Was gender a factor? Age seemed to have been a factor in some cases. Was religion a factor? Was, uh, you know, uh, Sean mentioned race as a factor. If you could brief comment on responding first of all to the senior citizen point, but also more generally. So there were certainly distinctions by age, as you you, you know, you saw the one that I that I presented, but 
those were actually less pronounced, I would say, than differences by partisan affiliation or political ideology. That's really where you see a big difference. We also found considerable differences um, by race and ethnicity. In particular, um, I didn't really present those today, but we had some interesting questions where we tried to get at those underlying assumptions about how free speech operates. So for instance, agree or disagree uh, with free speech, the truth ultimately wins out. Do you agree or disagree with that? Or um, free speech does more to protect majority opinions or does more to protect minority opinions. So those who advocate for free speech generally believe that the truth ultimately wins out. That's why you want to kind of allow that marketplace and that it, it does more to protect minority viewpoints rather than you know protecting the status quo. But for many of our students, particularly African-American and Hispanic students, they saw that differently. They felt like free speech was actually used as a way to kind of keep a hold to promote majority opinion and suppress minority viewpoints points. And they were a little less clear if the truth really won out. And so I think that those differences in assumption, that's really where I want to like kind of focus additional research that, you know, why do, why do people have different assumptions about how this operates? What experiences have different individuals have uh, had that, that shape these different views? And so ultimately the political, those partisan differences and differences by race were really where most of the differences were found on these issues. Great, thank you. So here's a question from one of my former students of 10 or 15 years ago. She contacted me recently and she signed on for this. So I'm going to read her question. It said, and it's this, with cancel culture, in quotes, at what point, if at all, does society forgive and move forward? Mm -hmm. Or is that whatever controversial thing that was said X amount of years ago forever haunts the person? particularly when what, what, whatever was said then was public, publicly acceptable. So this is, I suppose, the statute of limitations uh, in the sphere of social norms. Uh, Gordon, Don, you wanna have a take, take this on? You know, I think, I, think, I think we all, we all, especially in the hothouse of the university, we forget very quickly that the half-life of the university is four years. Uh, in four years, the the student population changes over. And again, I think about I think about Cornell and, and Don's book on on the Cornell takeover. Uh, you know, in the heat of that, people thought this will never go away. This will never die down. Cornell will never forget what happened. None of you listening to me today probably know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, uh, so some of this some of this is is a question of, of time. New hot buttons will replace old hot buttons. Um, Within a small, I, I do think that as we live in smaller and smaller tribes, then it's harder for these things to disappear. Because if the tribe is divine, defined by anti this or pro that, uh, and you were on the wrong side of that, that's a hard, hard thing to overcome. But I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I think Gordon's right. Except at Cornell, the memory's still fairly fresh for a lot of people. Cornell, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there's that the half life principle makes a lot of sense and. Uh, issues come and go. But as I point out in my more recent book, uh, this campus speech problem has been around now for 35 years. Yeah, that's true. And it hasn't, it didn't go away like McCarthyism yeah. went away. And the reason is internal. And the stuff that Sean and Emily are trying to get at, and I say, you know, you're doing a good job, but it's still a difficult thing to get entirely uh, in, in its entirety, uh, the culture. And that gets into changes in administration, uh, the growth of administration on campus and their agendas, which are not always consistent yeah. with the university's more proper mission, uh, as well as the, you know, the culture of harm. Uh, the harm principle is not as simple as it was back in Mill's time, which is another reason that people refer to being harmed by speech, which right. is both a kind of a genuine psychological thing, which I think is not a good thing in terms of psychological health. And it's also, as Sean points out, and Emily's nodding her head here, uh, mm -hmm. it's used as a political weapon. You know, you're psychologically devastating me. Yeah. Uh, you know, as John McWhorter said, sometimes that's just show acting, but sometimes <laughs> they mean it because of how they feel. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little more pessimistic than when I started the last book, that was four years ago. Uh, but let's, let's hope that, that um, the point about half-lives uh, that Gordon's talking about will, will come back.
Well, if I may interject in here, you talked about the external environment when you talked about, you know, combating cases and that come up in a particular campus. But I think the issue is that the external environment in terms of the views of elite institutions has changed in terms of, you know, what is acceptable and what is not. So I think, you know, that's a significant change in the zeitgeist in the political culture that's changed all of this now. Um, I political leaders ask question. Sorry? Quickly, very quickly, political leaders now are talking this talk. I think how different it might be if we had, you know, a president or really significant national leader that's sort of talking about why this cancel culture is a problem and means it and carries it through. That would be a significant shift a little bit, at least the potential for starting a significant shift in attitudes that would lead to the activation of the half-life principle. We don't okay, have there's one last question. And before I read it, I wanna first of all, thank everybody again, and also make a response to a question which says, will, will this talk be available? And it, it will be available on the Citrin Center website as both as a video. And also I think the slides and the content will also be available for people who want to take a closer look, a deserved closer look. So the last question was actually, let me see if I can get it back up here. And um, well, it was a question from Alan Unger and it talked about really, given the way the first amendment protects free speech and, and and political money, uh, do you you know do you think there's going to be a shift in the way people think about the First Amendment or the court thinks about the First Amendment and how it applies here? I think it was the question was directed at you, Gordon. So I'll give you the last word. Well, you know, there's 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 a endless debate about just the the, the genuine impact of money in in in, in politics, uh, and uh, but yeah, no, I think with the with the personnel on the court and their current age, uh, that's not going away. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, I think uh -huh. like it or love it, uh, we're going to live with it. Good. Well, let me let me end by thanking all of you again, and also thanking Eva Sito my master, my boss who makes this work and also Stephanie for helping manage the talk. I mean, I'm sorry for the echo. That was my fault. I'm terrible at this tech stuff. <laughs> anyway, I think it was a wonderful set of presentations. Berkeley is very grateful to all of you. Thank you very much. And that ends the webinar. Thank you. Thanks.